Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're tackling the greatly anticipated new addition to the Blood Bowl series, highlighting some essential tips that should give you a head start in the competition. For those of you who are extremely familiar with the series, this video will likely primarily serve as a refresher, but if you're trying to bring a friend into the world of Blood Bowl 3, or if you're a newcomer yourself, this video should give you a solid foundation of things to keep in mind as you build and manage your teams, take on the competition, and ideally, win. If you're looking for people to play with, check out the Discord link in the description down below, and if today's video helps you, please don't hesitate to hit that like button. But for now, without further ado, and with timestamps to jump around as you wish, let's begin. Understanding Stats and Skills Your player's stats and relevant skills are the very foundation upon which your decisions should be made, and while we'll discuss the process of building and upgrading your team in greater depth in the next section, it's essential to first understand what these stats are and when they're relevant. Each player type will have a different baseline across their movement allowance, strength, agility, passing ability, and armor value, and at times these numbers will be modified as a result of what's happening on the pitch because of special skills or because of injuries, as we'll highlight later in this video. While the first two stats are rarely, if ever, rolled against, armor value is always rolled for using two six-sided dice and the other two use one six-sided dice instead. Keep in mind what this notation means. A two plus means any result including or higher than two counts as a success. A three plus means any result including or higher than three counts as a success instead, so on and so forth. In other words, a smaller number here indicates a higher chance of success. Movement allowance represents how many squares an individual can move in their turn if left uninterrupted by enemy tackles. Keep in mind that all players are able to move an extra two tiles beyond this number, but those additional tiles of movement come at a risk since dice will be rolled for each of those two steps to see if the player slips and falls while overextending themselves. The likelihood of failing those rolls is minimal with successes on a 2+, but it's a risk to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is that if a player is on the ground for whatever reason, it costs 3 movement allowance to stand up, unless they have special skills that negate that cost. This means a downed player can typically move less after standing up, and in the case of slower players, sometimes not at all. The next stat, Strength, is also never really rolled against, though it's used constantly to determine how things play out when one player tries to shove another around the pitch using the block action. Anytime such an engagement takes place between two players, their strengths are compared to see how many results dice will be rolled. If both players have matching strengths, only one dice is rolled to determine the result. If the difference between strength is one or two higher in favor of the attacker, two results dice will be rolled, and if the attacker's strength is more than twice that of the defender, three results dice will be rolled instead. In the case of multiple results dice being rolled, the attacker can choose from them to determine what actually happens. Keep in mind that a player can block somebody with a higher strength stat as well, though in such a case, the defender gets to pick the result from the rolled dice, and so it's a serious gamble at the best of times. There are ways to overcome that risk though, and we'll discuss them in just a moment. The agility stat is rolled against fairly constantly. It's used to dodge tackles, to pick up the ball, and to catch incoming passes. To actually make a pass, the passing ability stat is rolled against, with the distance of the pass applying a modifier to the roll. Keep in mind that rather than actually throwing the ball to pass it to another player, you can perform a handoff instead by standing next to them and simply handing it to them. This avoids the need for a passing ability roll, but the receiving player still needs to roll an agility check to catch the ball. The last stat here is armor value, and this one's a bit of an outlier. Armor value is rolled anytime the player drops to the ground or is intentionally fouled. The roll involves two six-sided dice instead of the usual one, and this is the rare case where you actually want your players to fail their rolls, as a successful roll means their armor was beaten, resulting in an injury or perhaps even death. That means a player with a higher armor value is safer, and again, this is the rare occasion where a bigger number is to the player's advantage, unlike agility or passing ability where a smaller number is to their advantage. There are, of course, a multitude of skills that a player can acquire or otherwise start with that impact when dice get rolled, what kinds of modifiers apply, and the best way to use a player that is otherwise statistically the same as another. A player with the block skill, for example, 
doesn't suffer the negative impacts of both down, a common result dice when blocking that typically drops both attacker and defender to the floor. A player with a block skill, then, is an ideal one to use for the purpose of blocking since they have a lower chance of suffering negative impacts. Similarly, there are skills that let players reroll failed dodge checks, failed pickup checks, and much more, and there are other skills that make checks more challenging for the enemy, like the prehensile tail mutation that makes it harder to dodge tackles from a specific player that has said mutation. There are plenty of skills to get familiar with, so make sure you spend some time doing so. It'll allow you to be more efficient and make game time decisions based on both your own and opposing players. But with all that out of the way, let's discuss team building. Building your team and seeing it develop over time is probably one of the most satisfying aspects of the Blood Bowl games. You'll hire players, see them improve over time, and watch them die on the pitch, wondering whether you should have spent more money on additional cheerleaders or temporarily recruiting a unique star player for the next game instead. As such an integral part of the game, it can also be a bit daunting. The first order of business is to pick a faction. You can either choose according to your preferred playstyle or tailor your playstyle according to your preferred faction. Skaven, for example, are very fast on the field, but they also have lower strength on average, meaning you don't typically want to engage in shoving matches, and you're not likely to see most of your players live long enough to level up significantly. Orcs are strong and hardy, though the concept of passing the ball eludes them completely. But hey, you don't need to pass the ball around if you've killed the opposing team. Literally. Dwarfs, meanwhile, are hardy and good at controlling the pitch, but they're very slow with a very mediocre passing game, a statement that has surely secured my place in their silly book of grudges. If you'd like a full rundown of the different factions and how best to use them, let me know in the comments below, and if enough people are interested, I might make a full faction guide series so you know how to use each team to the fullest. At the end of the day, though, there is a lot about team building that's common across the factions. For one, keep in mind that you need at least 11 players for the team to actually be usable, but keep in mind also that you'll want backup players should your active 11 get removed from the pitch mid-game for any reason, like death. Each player type costs a certain amount of money, and you'll need to consider the benefit of having more cheap players in place of a particularly expensive one. Do not feel as though you absolutely must have one of each type. Save your money for additional players if it fits your preferred approach, and keep money aside for things like team rerolls and apothecaries that can help keep your players alive, and the game in your favor too. Having multiple backup players can be especially helpful when you're playing as a squishier team that is more likely to see deaths or perhaps injuries that prevent a player from playing concurrent games. Having extra money set aside will also let you draw from the team's treasury to spend on pre-game inducements, benefits that can be brought in on a per-game basis if you find yourself in desperate circumstances. Either way, make your picks based on how you want to play with a team, but also remember to lean into your team's strengths and avoid their weaknesses. A single Rat Ogre, for example, costs as much as three linesmen you could use to fill up your ranks and eventually train up with good tackling and blocking skills. On that note, your players gain what's called star player points based on their actions on the pitch, injuring opposing players outside of fouls, successfully making passes, scoring touchdowns, and being the MVP of a game are the key ways to earn these points, which can then be used to unlock additional skills or improve player characteristics. Skills fall into primary and secondary categories, or are entirely unavailable depending on the player type, and purchasing skills is more or less expensive depending on said designation. Within each category, you can choose exactly what to buy for a higher cost, or you can spend less and get a randomly chosen skill from the category instead. It's not a bad idea to be picky at first especially, tailoring players for certain tasks, Securing a kicker that can more accurately place the ball, for example, is a good idea, and giving your ball carriers the ability to actually hold on to the ball is nothing short of genius. Alternatively, you can spend a significant chunk on improving characteristics. This is a great way to double down on strengths or negate weaknesses, but you'll need to collect star player points across multiple matches with a concerted effort, and there's always a chance that the player might just die in the process or get an injury that basically makes them useless. Proceed with caution. On which note, let's discuss how to manage risks. This is a game of minimizing your own risks while maximizing those of your opponent. 
pretty much every decision you make is going to be about managing risks, and one of the main reasons for that is the turnover rule. Every time the currently active side fails a roll, unless they have a reroll available for some reason or another, their turn immediately comes to an end, and the game moves on to the opposing team's next turn. Even with a reroll available, if that reroll is failed, the turnover still happens. Since there's a limited number of turns in a single game, losing part of a turn like that can cost you a touchdown at best, and the entire game at worst. In order to avoid these premature turnovers, you'll want to always perform your actions in the order of least risky to most risky whenever possible. Keep in mind that anytime dice are rolled for any action or check, a roll of 6 is always a success, and a roll of 1 is always a failure. This means that there's always a chance of pulling off what seems to be an impossible task, and there's also always a chance of failing what should be a ridiculously easy one. With that in mind, you should always have your downed players stand up and move into positions as needed, since there's pretty much zero risk involved unless they're traveling through enemy tackle zones. Separately, you should also pay attention to skill descriptions that specify what doesn't cause a turnover where it otherwise would. For example, a player without the block skill would cause a turnover on a both down result when blocking, but a player with the block skill wouldn't. Pick your battles accordingly. Similarly, you should pick your ball handlers and passers and receivers carefully. Some skills allow the player to re-roll failed attempts at picking the ball up. Other skills improve a player's ability to pass or catch the ball. While you might not always be able to use them for the task at hand, you should certainly try to prioritize them and build your formations accordingly. And, as far as passing is concerned, don't forget that you can perform a handoff to any player adjacent to the ball carrier, avoiding the pass roll entirely, meaning there's one less point of failure as only your receiver needs to roll to catch rather than both players. You should also make sure to tell players exactly how to navigate the pitch by placing multiple move orders that ensure they go exactly where you want them to every step of the way. The game typically does a good job of finding the safest path from point A to point B, but at times the safest path isn't the most optimal one for what you're trying to accomplish, as I'll exemplify in just a little bit. Otherwise, plotting out what you're planning on doing before hitting go will also ensure you're using the right type of activation. Few things are more frustrating than realize you didn't specify you were planning on passing and finding yourself with the ball in the wrong hands at the end of your turn. As you're deciding what order to make moves in, you should also keep in mind that while your players can move in any order, a single player must complete their entire turn before you switch to a different one. So, while ideally you're doing things in the order of least risky to most risky, at times you'll need to take a chance for the greater good of the team. Having team rerolls on hand is a great call, but make sure not to use them too prematurely. You'll only have a limited number based on how many you've paid for with your team's budget, and while turnovers always feel bad, you should make sure to save rerolls for the truly rough ones. As stated earlier though, it's not just about minimizing your own risks, but also about maximizing your opponent's risks. Unless your team is particularly low strength and easily pushed around, try to position them so that your opponent's players are always having to dodge your tackles, and place your players in a way that makes it harder for the opponent to make passes, and try also to take advantage of skills that threaten opportunities that your opponent might otherwise take advantage of. Again, see for example, block or prehensile tail. Above all, whether minimizing or maximizing risks, your best ally on the field is going to be using adjacency and positioning. The proper use of positioning can absolutely make or break a play as determined by tackle zones, assists, and modifiers on dice rolls. Tackle zones are the tiles immediately adjacent to a player, and any opposing player that tries to leave, go through, or otherwise pass between tiles within a tackle zone needs to roll a dodge check based on their agility. If multiple opposing players have overlapping tackle zones, the tiles where those overlaps occur will apply an appropriately stacked penalty to the dodge roll instead. Using these overlaps, you can almost entirely close an angle of approach against an opponent with low agility, though remember, a roll of 6 is always a success, including for dodge rolls. Tackle zones have an additional purpose, and that's to shut down assists. As mentioned earlier, when a player tries to block another in order to shove them around or to the ground, the strength stat is compared between the two to determine how many dice are rolled and who picks the result. 
This stat is further boosted by any adjacent players from the same team through what's called an assist, and these assists apply on both sides of the equation. So, if your player has a strength of 2, and they're going up against somebody with a strength of 3, you'll want to have at least one person assisting on your end to add plus 1 to your player's strength stat and balance the equation. You can take it a step further and bring an additional assisting player adjacent to the soon-to-be victim, and another, and another, until the equation is suitably in your favor for the task at hand. Players on either side are considered to be assisting only if they are adjacent to the actively involved player on the opposing side. That means offensive assists only come from players adjacent to the target, and defensive assists only come from players adjacent to the attacker. This is why it's important to micromanage your angle of approach as discussed earlier, and to specify where you're standing when you attack, as positioning will determine who's actually assisting and who's left behind, ultimately impacting how many dice are rolled and your chances of success. Bear in mind though, any of these assisting players who are in an uninvolved opposing player's tackle zone will not be able to assist as they'll be considered marked. And you should also keep in mind, as stated earlier, that the equation applies on both sides. So, if you have weak units, you should keep assisting units adjacent to them to provide a boost to their strength should they get blocked by a strong enemy unit. It's a good idea then to shove enemy assisting units away without following them when possible, as this allows you to remove the aforementioned marked status while still providing assists against a central target. Players are also able to assist their teammates through adjacency when you want to foul a downed enemy. Each unmarked opposing player standing adjacent to a downed player reduces their armor value when protecting against a foul. This makes it more likely that they'll suffer an injury or even death. See, there's always a risk of getting caught when performing a foul, so having this assistance will at least make it more likely for you to get a positive result even if your player gets booted from the game. One final major reason to consider positioning and adjacency has to do with role modifiers. If the ball is on the ground, any player that goes to pick it up must make a roll based on their agility stat. This roll will see negative modifiers for each opposing player that's standing adjacent to the ball, making it much harder to pick up and making a failure and resulting turnover that much more likely. Similar logic applies to passing. A player surrounded by opposing players will suffer a penalty to their ability to catch the ball. As you can see, it's very important to use tackle zones, adjacency, positioning, and assists to not just maintain control of the situation, but to keep the odds in your favor too. And hey, if all else fails, use injuries. Sure, you need touchdowns to win the game, and touchdowns earn you money, but you only really need one more touchdown than the opposing team to win, and you know what makes it easier to score touchdowns? If all the opposing team's players are dead or otherwise off the pitch. Even when you have an easy touchdown ahead of you, check to see if you might be able to get a few blocks in before scoring. A good hit or two might just remove a player from the rest of the game. Separately, if an opposing player gets too close to the edge, try to come at them from the side, using blocks to push them out of bounds and let the fans injure them for you. Stack tackle zones to not just make it harder for enemy players to move, but to make it more likely to drop them and potentially cause injuries. And if you don't manage to injure them with a tackle or a block, consider following up with a foul. Remember, a prone player needs to spend three movement allowance to stand up, a stunned player is unable to do anything for a whole turn and then needs to stand up in the next turn afterwards anyway, and a knocked out player is out of the game until they get a lucky dice roll, post touchdown, or at the half. And an injured player might be completely useless depending on the injury or in the case of death. Make sure to have an apothecary on hand to try and minimize the worst of your own player's injuries, but don't ever forget the benefits of spilling blood in a game of Blood Bowl. Make sure, as always, to play to the strengths of your team though. Some are better at causing injuries, and some are better at dying. Don't go chasing the enemy if you're the latter. But there you have it folks, 5 essential tips to keep in mind as you play Blood Bowl 3, and I sincerely hope this video has given you some guidance to get you ahead in the game. If you found this video helpful, please don't hesitate to let me know by leaving a like and a comment down below, and feel free to share it around with your friends just to make sure they're up to speed too. With that said folks, if you're looking for people to play with, don't forget to join the Discord linked in the description down below as we have an extremely active Warhammer fanbase in that Discord, and I'm sure a lot of folks are going to be diving into Blood Bowl 3. And if not that, 
there's always Blood Bowl 2. With all that said, as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.